Coming up. At this point, there was no hope. A stopped heart. There is nothing that we can do for her. And a torn aorta. Really, it's a death sentence. One divine message on the road. And I knew the Lord was with me no matter what. And a three in one miracle. Anything that came out, it was all God, you know. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. For today's top stories, let's go over to the CBN News Desk. Gordon, Russia is preparing to strike back against Washington after the White House issued sanctions against Moscow over alleged interference in the presidential election. Even though some analysts say the president's sanctions are not very strong, Dale Hurd has the story. It comes in response to President Obama's move Thursday, ordering 35 Russian diplomats to leave the U.S. in 72 hours and two Russian compounds considered spy nests to be closed. The sanctions hit Moscow's two leading intelligence agencies, four officials, and two cyber criminals wanted by the FBI for alleged Russian cyber meddling in the U.S. presidential election. The sanctions were aggressive and they were bold, and they're designed to send a message to Russia that this type of behavior is unacceptable. President Obama said Russian President Vladimir Putin was behind the cyber actions against the U.S. Not much happens in Russia without Vladimir Putin. But critics point out that this is the same president who mocked Republican presidential candidate Mitt Romney in 2012 over the Russian threat, saying the Cold War was over. Russia's government continued to deny the charges of interfering with the election. Russia's London embassy mocked President Obama's sanctions on Twitter with the photo of a lame duck, saying that everybody, including the American people, will be glad to see the last of this hapless administration. President-elect Donald Trump said the U.S. should move on, but also said he planned to meet with U.S. intelligence leaders next week to learn more about the Russian interference which did not affect the outcome of the presidential election. I think we ought to get on with our lives. Uh, the whole you know, age of computer has made it where nobody knows exactly what's going on. Some top Republicans supported the sanctions, calling the president's action long overdue. Dale Hurd, CBN News. New York City is taking serious precautions against any possible terrorist attack on New Year's Eve. The New York Police Department has deployed 65 sand trucks along with other vehicles because of the concern about lone wolf terrorist attacks, like using cars or trucks to run into people in the crowd. Music can bring peace or joy in the most difficult circumstances. Keith and Kristen Getty reached the world through their songs, such as In Christ Alone. Caitlin Burke spoke with the songwriters about their Irish Christmas tour around the U.S., a tour they hoped would help bring this divided country together again. When asked about big moments of 2016, Keith Getty has a long list. From a new album release to a whirlwind Christmas tour, he and his wife Kristen are very thankful. And it's just, it's been a very, it's been a very exciting year creatively. It's like a lot of things have exploded with it. The Gettys are world-renowned contemporary hymn writers. Their songs are sung by over a hundred million people each year, some of them in some of the biggest concert halls around the world. For the Gettys, 2016's first big project was to help organize a global day of song. People in a hundred countries joined together to sing the 90-year-old hymn Facing a Task Unfinished. It was written by Frank Houghton, originally as a call for missionaries to come to China. Keith and Kristen updated the hymn, hoping to inspire worldwide evangelism. I think it's important that we sing mission. What we sing and what our children sing affects every part of our life and every part of their lives. So if we're not singing about mission, we're not thinking about mission. We're not praying about mission. We're certainly not weeping or feeling guilty about mission. So it has to be part of our, of our existence. The Gettys also released two major projects in 2016. The first is studio album. Facing a task unfinished is the title track and cornerstone. This album was all about how singing fuels mission. Um, so the songs are either missional songs or they're testimony songs. And we wanted to get people excited about mission, but we also brought this global aspect to the whole project to try and encourage people to be involved in mission around the world. The second, a children's album called Getty's Kids Hymnal in Christ Alone. 
It features 12 songs recorded with a children's choir joining the Gettys Band. I know for me the songs that I sung as a child, they're the passages of scripture I remember. I know the hymns that I sang taught me a deeper understanding of, of, of the world and, and our place in the world. That album debuted at number two on the charts. Finally, the Gettys wrapped up the year with their Irish Christmas tour. 20 shows in top concert halls around the U.S., many of them sold out. This year, the couple hoped it would bring people together after such a divisive political year. Carols remind us of the big story of grace, of, of, of God becoming a, a child, God becoming man, and God ultimately dying and rising for us. And they tell us of a bigger story and a bigger kingdom than politics could ever promise. Gifts of kindness to Caitlin Burke, CBN News, New York. It'll be a fun concert to attend. Well, if you've been planning to give some money to charity this year, but just haven't gotten around to it, you're not alone. Nearly a third of all charitable donations are given in the month of December. So while it still may be late in the year, it's not too late if you want to make a contribution. And speaking of charitable giving, let's go back over to Terry for more on that subject. Well, there are only a few more days left in the year and even fewer days left to make a charitable donation that you can deduct from your taxes this year. We'd like to encourage you to give to CBN. When you do, your gift helps bring food, clothing, and medical aid to people all around the world. And it's also used to spread the gospel. Because your donation is tax deductible, you'll be saving money on your tax bill. In short, you'll be a blessing and you'll be blessed as well. So call now, 1-800-700-7000. That's 1-800-700-7000. You can also log on to CBN.com. We'll be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. C.S. Lewis once described history as a story written by the finger of God. Well, that's certainly true when it comes to religious freedom. Wendy Griffith brings us this look at the life of one Christian leader and one church in American history. Kara Schmidt and Vince Oliveri are getting married on a perfect June day in a most unusual place. Under this striking structure is the foundation of an 18th century church with an astonishing history. For over 45 years, the only clue of its existence was this marker. Then in 1975, it caught the attention of a local Presbyterian minister. I began to read and find what how significant a place it was. And the thought that came to my mind, your task is to shine the light on the man I really want to honor. That man is Samuel Davies, the first minister at Paul Green Church and a key figure in the religious movement known as the First Great Awakening. We see it in almost every colony. Uh, we see Great Awakening evangelists, we see revivals, we see these massive meetings, large-scale conversions. It really changes the face of America. But there was plenty of resistance. Before the American Revolution, British law required membership in the Church of England. Failure to comply could result in fines and even imprisonment. In 1689, the British Parliament passed the Act of Toleration, allowing some Protestant denominations limited freedom. Samuel Davies became the first so-called dissenter licensed in Virginia. Despite frequent bouts with tuberculosis, he was asked to lead four meeting houses in Hanover and Henrico counties with Paul Green as his base. Being fully convinced that Hanover stood in greater need of a minister than any place I knew, I accepted of their call to settle there. This is Samuel Davies' Bible, where centuries of family events are recorded, including his wedding to Sarah Kirkpatrick in October 1746. Less than a year later, he wrote this, separated from her by death and bereaved of an abortive son. Because of that tragedy and, and because of his own sickness, he, he really thought that his life would be, would be short. It motivated him. I mean, he really thought, well, if I only have so much time on earth to, to work for the Lord, I'm, I've got to make that count. From the beginning, Davies drew large crowds, including slaves. 
Never have I been so much struck with the appearance of an assembly as when I have glanced my eyes to so many black countenances, whom their masters generally neglect, as though immortality was not the privilege of their souls, nor the religion of Jesus their concern. Not everyone in Hanover County was pleased with Davy's ministry, especially at this Anglican church, led by the Reverend Patrick Henry, uncle of the famous Patriot with the same name. If you were the Anglican minister, and, and that was the official religion of the, of the colony, if you see the explosive growth of, of Baptist and Presbyterian uh, churches, it in many ways it is a threat. Reverend Henry fought back with a series of letters to authorities in the Church of England. I think it my duty to acquaint you with this man's behavior. I need not inform you of the present distracted condition of my parish, nor of the future disturbances I justly apprehend. His nephew, the younger Patrick Henry, was 11 when Davies arrived. He attended Paul Green regularly with his mother, later attributing his own success as an orator to Davies' example. On July 1st, 1759, after 11 years in Hanover County, Samuel Davies delivered his final sermon at Paul Green. More than 5,000 people attended. 100 years later, Paul Green Church still thrived, as shown in these drawings by a Union soldier in 1862, the only images of the church that survive. On June 1, 1864, Union forces tried to break through Confederate lines near the Tatapatamoy Creek. Paul Green Church, caught in the crossfire, burned to the ground. This is the original four acres we started with right here. Mm -hmm. The church was never rebuilt until Robert Bluford came across the marker. Since then, he's been consumed with bringing the church back to life. One day, while with an archaeological team, he felt something under his foot. Scraped the dirt <laughs> aside, and there was this brick, whole, complete brick. And within an hour, we uncovered the complete footing of this. Uh, You're kidding. This, this building. This is the first house to come down. Renowned architect Carlton Abbott also caught the vision. He urged Bluford to purchase adjoining land, removing houses to restore the area to the way it was in the 1700s. Then came the question of rebuilding the church. We thought about doing an image or a ghost structure, if you will. And I think what this church does is, is bring a simpler uh, feel for how you can approach your religion. Today, the site includes history lessons on Samuel Davies and the path to religious freedom in America. And it's become a popular site for weddings, like this one, where the groom is a PhD candidate in church history. God's amazing grace has been preached here since Samuel Davies was pastoring here. I'm thinking about that actually even during the ceremony and, and as we were picking the place has just been really kind of mm -hmm. profound. A good foundation, indeed. Wendy Griffith, CBN News, Hanover County, Virginia. That's a wonderful piece, a great history lesson. Samuel Davies went on to be the fourth president of Princeton University. Back then it was known as the Log Cabin uh, College, and it was a place where uh, Harvard and Yale had become too liberal, and so we needed to get back to the roots of the gospel, and that's the beginning of Princeton. Uh, what a wonderful story and what a wonderful heritage that we have in the United States to realize all our religious freedoms, the wonderful freedoms that we have, were all bought with a price, all came through persecution, all came from what happens when you have an established church, and how can you have freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, all of these things rooted uh, in this wonderful great awakening. Uh, my history professor long ago said there would be no American Revolution, it would have never happened, if it hadn't been for the Great Awakening of 1735 to 1740. Without that, we wouldn't have the United States of America. 
What a remarkable spot. I actually like the fact that they just have put the windows and the frame there. It just is pretty significant. It's yeah, such an illustration. A church is not a building. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But what an impact on society. Well, coming up, a doctor gives a daughter some devastating news. It's very serious. Your mom has a torn aorta. There is nothing that we can do for her. He said, really, it's a death sentence. Watch this mother and daughter defy that death sentence when we come back. Emily Eminen was rushed to the emergency room where her heart stopped beating for 10 minutes. Tests revealed that she had a torn aorta and her doctor said it was a death sentence. When her family and friends heard the news, they went into full prayer mode. And the results were not one, not two, but three miracles. August 2006. Lorraine Potter drove her mother Emily to the emergency room. She was complaining a lot. The pain was strong. Um, she said, you know, I, it's a 10, it's a level 10 pain. It's, it's very strong. And she had never experienced that before, but she thought it was her heart. As hospital staff performed a cardiac catheterization test, Emily's heart quit beating. Doctors struggled to revive her. After 10 minutes, they found a pulse and she eventually stabilized. Soon after, a doctor told Lorraine the terrible news. He sat me down and said, um, it's, it's very serious. Your mom has a torn aorta. There is nothing that we can do for her. Um, as per policy, we are going to send her to Iowa City, to University of Iowa Hospitals. But we, um, we know uh, from experience there's really nothing they can do either. He said, really, this is a, it's a death sentence. Lorraine called family to join her and pray. Then she spent a few minutes alone with her mom. I felt like that was the last time I was going to see her alive. So as, as much as I could, I spoke to her, um, told her I loved her, was able to, to, um, to stroke her hair, to kiss her, you know, that, and that was all I could do. The level of anxiety, the level of grief was very high. Um, at this point, there was no hope. You know, there was no, no hope I had been given. Emily was transported to the university hospital. When Lorraine arrived minutes later, she noticed a license plate that read YHWH, Yahweh, the intimate name of God. At that moment, Lorraine says she felt his presence. The peace that passes all understanding that guarded my heart and mind kicked in and came over me. And, uh, and from that moment on, my anxiety was gone. My hopes are eternal and my hopes are in Christ. And I knew where my mom was going, no matter what. And I knew the Lord was with me, no matter what. Doctors ran a new catheterization test to confirm the first diagnosis. Then they told Lorraine their findings. He said, um, Emily came in with a, with a torn aorta, and so as per our uh, policy, we re-examine you know, the, the diagnosis that, that, is, that they come in with. Um, we've done all the tests that we could, um, and, uh, and there is no torn aorta. What was clearly visible just hours ago was now healed. You know, anything that came out, it was all God, you know? The new tests, however, did reveal a 90% blockage in an artery near her heart. When they went in to place a stint, the blockage also disappeared. Really, there was nothing doctors could do. Um, God was doing a healing. You know, they hadn't been able to touch her. Uh, they hadn't been able to perform anything. Nothing man did um, was healing her. This was all God. Um, he uh, healed the torn aorta. Um, he removed the blockage. Doctors were still worried about another issue. The doctor explained to me at that point that they were not sure of her brain function. Uh, that it was, a, it was a concern to them because she had been gone for 10 minutes, 10 full minutes. Um, they didn't know what her brain function would be like when she came out. The next morning, Emily woke up and tried to communicate. My mom was uh, lying on her bed, fully intubated, trying to use sign language. We can't understand her. Finally, she gets, she's frustrated enough, so they get her a, a clipboard and a marker and she writes down, no anterograde or retrograde amnesia. So I said, okay, well, I think her brain function's there. I think she's back. Miraculously, she had no signs of brain damage either. 
Emily and Lorraine say the presence of God sustained them through the entire experience. You know, I know I was touched by God, and I, I think when He touches you, you can't even explain it. It would have been fine with me if I had gone that night, but I didn't, and the Lord had something else in store, and I felt fabulous. It, it, was, it was an experience that I will never forget because of the way I felt when I woke up. I just felt like I wanted to stand up and dance and scream and, and sing and whatever, you know, it just felt so good. Today, Emily's heart is healthy. Though questions remain regarding what exactly happened, Lorraine knows it was God with them that made all the difference. The Lord really healed me three times. If you can have three miracles in one miracle, I really did. No torn aorta, no blockage, no brain damage. The joy of having her back was wonderful, but greater was the peace of having him with us. Why he did this for me, I don't know. I loved him before, I love him now. It's not for me to question why, other than if I can glorify him, that's the most important thing. He is a merciful God and he does miracles today not just in biblical times, and he does major miracles today. Wow, what an amazing story. What an amazing experience with God. I know that there are lots of you watching who are saying, I need a miracle in my life. And so we wanna pray for you right now. We wanna encourage your faith as we go into that. Gordon, let me share this with you. This was last March, Sandra from Saparia, Trinidad, had itching in her right ear. Ear, she had a discharge draining, had lost her hearing in that ear. The doctor prescribed medication, but nothing worked. On the 25th of July, she was watching this program and she heard you give this word of knowledge. Someone with problems in your right ear, recurring deep infections, discharges out of that ear. God is able to heal it and make it so it never comes back again. You're restored now in Jesus' name. Sandra thought, that's me. She claimed the word the next morning, the drainage should stop. She could hear clearly in her right ear and ear and no problem since then. All right, well, here's Dan from California. He had a sudden hit of intense pain in his back and trouble getting in and out of bed each day. He was diagnosed with arthritis, two other diseases. He was given some medicine for pain, but nothing helped. One day, watching the 700 Club, Terry said, you have an issue with your back. It's really immobilized you in many ways. You can't lean forward, you can't lean back. Just put your hand behind your back, lift your other hand up in the air and say, yes, God, I receive this. It's for you today. Well, the next morning, Dan felt no pain in his back and has not had any pain since that day. Miracles happen today. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he did 2,000 years ago, he's still doing today. And the Bible is very clear. He went around doing good, healing all those who were oppressed by the devil. Go read it. It's in Acts chapter 10, verse 38. He went around doing good. Now, think about your own life. Wouldn't it be great if Jesus went around doing good? And we can say all things work together for good. Now, all things, that includes anything that's afflicting you right now. So just as Terry said uh, to that man, Dan in California, put your hand on that area of the body that needs healing. Lift your other hand up to him and realize the kingdom of God is at hand. It's right there with you. All you have to do is ask for it. When you ask, believing, you receive. So we're going to pray, and we're going to agree with you, and we're going to let God do all the rest. What he's promised to do, he will do for you. Let's pray. Lord, we just lift the needs of the audience, and as people are laying hands on that area of the body that needs healing, and raising the other hand up to you, we just come into agreement with them now, and we ask that the kingdom of God would come, that your will would be done in their bodies and in their lives today. And Lord, when we look to your kingdom, when we look to heaven, there's no one sick, there's no one dismayed, there's no one lonely, there's no one in poverty, 
YOU SUPPLY EVERY HUMAN NEED. SO, LORD, ANSWER THEIR PRAYERS NOW. BRING HEALING TO THEM NOW. REACH DOWN AND TOUCH AND LET YOUR WILL BE DONE NOW IN JESUS' NAME. THERE'S SOMEONE YOU'VE BEEN IN A CAR ACCIDENT AND uh, I DON'T KNOW HOW IT HAPPENED IN, in YOUR BACK AND your, AND YOUR RIGHT SHOULDER, uh, BUT JUST TREMENDOUS PAIN FROM FRACTURES, DISLOCATIONS, AND GOD IS ABLE TO HEAL THAT RIGHT NOW IN JESUS' NAME. THAT PAIN JUST LEFT YOU AND BEGIN TO DO WHAT YOU COULDN'T DO BEFORE. RAISE YOUR RIGHT ARM AND REALIZE GOD HAS DONE A TREMENDOUS MIRACLE FOR YOU. IT'S GOING TO BE STIFF RIGHT NOW, BUT JUST CONTINUE TO MOVE IT AND REALIZE EVERYTHING IS FREE. THE PAIN IS GONE NOW IN JESUS' NAME. A SPINAL STENOSIS BEING HEALED IN JESUS' NAME. AND SOMEONE ELSE, YOU'VE HAD A, IT'S JUST COME UPON YOU LIKE A MENTAL FOGGINESS AND YOU'RE SO FEARFUL THAT IT'S, THAT IT'S SOMETHING PERMANENT. IT'S, GOD IS HEALING THAT FOR YOU RIGHT NOW. IT'S JUST GOING TO, A CLARITY IS GOING TO COME TO YOU. YOUR THOUGHT is PATTERN IS RETURNING. Uh, YOUR ABILITY TO COMMUNICATE, JUST RECEIVE THAT. Uh, THERE'S SOMEONE YOU'RE IN A HOSPITAL RIGHT NOW AND YOU HAVE AN INFECTION IN YOUR SPINAL FLUID AND GOD IS ABLE. HE'S ABLE TO ALLOW YOU TO WALK OUT OF THAT HOSPITAL WITH NEWNESS OF LIFE, mm. NEWNESS OF ENERGY. HE'S TAKING THAT AFFECTION ALL THE WAY NOW IN JESUS' NAME. Mm. SOMEONE ELSE WITH A HIP ALIGNMENT, THAT'S JUST STRAIGHTENING OUT AND YOU'LL NOT NEED SURGERY. LORD, WE THANK YOU. YOU'RE THE HEALER, YOU'RE THE RESTORER, YOU'RE THE DELIVERER, YOU'RE OUR SAVIOR, YOU'RE OUR ALL IN ALL. WE THANK YOU FOR IT IN JESUS' NAME. Amen. Amen. If you've been touched by God, we want to share in your good report. We want to tell people of all the miracles He's doing today. And if you want to call us, all you have to do is pick up the phone. Number's toll free, 1 800 759 0700. And if you need prayer, we're here for you. It's our honor, our privilege to pray with you. We believe in prevailing prayer, the prayer that gets an answer. So if you want us to pray with you, just give us a call. Terry? Well, still ahead, an eight-year-old wakes up from a coma and tells his mom some stunning news. I said, Landon, do you know where your dad is at? And he told me, yes, I know where he's at. I saw him in heaven. Stay tuned to see what happens next. That's coming up. Welcome back to the 700 Club. VidAngel has taken another legal action in its battle against Hollywood Studios. VidAngel is a streaming service that allows families to filter content, such as language, nudity, and violence from movies. A judge had granted a request by the studios for a preliminary injunction against VidAngel, meaning the company has to stop streaming movies it hasn't gotten licenses for. VidAngel asked that the injunction be delayed, but the judge said no. So VidAngel is now asking the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals to delay the injunction. The company plans to appeal the case all the way to the Supreme Court. Operation Blessing helped people in Bethlehem who are struggling to make ends meet with their Christmas celebrations. Joseph, a skilled craftsman and a, a carpenter, was barely able to provide for his family. But thanks to Operation Blessing, he was given a truckload full of olive wood free of charge. And more than 140 orphans also enjoyed an Operation Blessing sponsored Christmas event that included gifts for them all. And you can find out more about Operation Blessing by going online to ob.org. Gordon and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. The Bible talks about streams in the desert, and in Senegal, that verse is coming true, thanks to one dedicated missionary and a partnership with CBN. When Pastor Joseph retired, there were lots of things he could have done. He's an educated man with two master's degrees. He's fluent in five languages, including Arabic. In fact, his Arabic is so good, he was asked to teach it. But with many opportunities in front of him, he chose to move to one of the most dangerous communities in Senegal for a very important mission. There are a lot of people hurting here, and crime is very high. Children born here have little hope because it is so hard to farm in this region. 
Agriculture is a way to approach the people here, and I want to share Jesus with them. But when Pastor Joseph started his farm, like everyone else, he struggled to grow anything. It rains only a few inches during a two-month growing season in July and August. So he was excited when CBN offered to help. Together with our partners from Innovation Africa and the Alliance for Global Good, we dug a deep water well, installed a solar-powered pump and monitoring system. Then we added Israeli drip irrigation technology, and the African desert began to bloom. Soon, the fields were ready to harvest. The crops sold quickly and for a good profit. With the new system, Pastor Joseph is now growing crops year-round. That got the attention of his Muslim neighbors. They started coming to the center, where Pastor Joseph told them about the new technology. He also invited them to learn more about Jesus. Some even prayed to become Christians. In this way, a small Christian community was born right here on my farm. And every Sunday, we meet and pray together. Pastor Joseph also has a heart for the children of his community. He's using CBN's Superbook programs to introduce them to the God of the Bible. Because of the solar panels, well and irrigation, we have had a record harvest. We have clean drinking water, improving health in the children, and more jobs for young people here. Thank you, CBN, for your partnership. The people here are now regaining their dignity. At the same time, they have the privilege of hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're the, a member of the 700 Club, thank you, because you're part of that. You're part of providing water to that village. You're part of pro providing the gospel to that village. You're part of all that we do. If you're not a member, we invite you to join. How much is it? It's just $20 a month, 65 cents a day. And so if you'd like to do that, give us a call. 1-800-759-0700. Just say, I want to be a part of the 700 Club. When you call, ask for Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving where the bank does all the work and there's no checks to write. We save so much on the processing we can send as our gift to you Power for Life monthly teaching CDs. So if you want those uh, to help you grow in your faith, uh, it's yours when you join Pledge Express. So do it now. 1-800-759-0700. Terry? Well, coming up later, he spent two weeks in a coma and made three trips to heaven. I've seen Jesus. I know he's there. He's asked me to do this, and this is what I'm doing. He'll tell you what else he saw in heaven, so don't go away. Landon Whitley was eight years old when he hopped into his parents' Pontiac and took the very first of three trips to heaven. I didn't see what he was yelling at. I didn't see the ambulance coming, but I remembered him yelling. That was the last thing I heard from him. On a Sunday morning in 1997, Julie Kemp, her husband Andy, and their eight-year-old son Landon were driving home from church when an ambulance returning to its station broadsided their car in an intersection. Andy died instantly. Rescuers stabilized Julie, but did not realize there was a third passenger in the car. They couldn't see his body because of the damage that was done to the driver's side of the car, and Landon was sitting behind his dad. And when they saw Landon's shoe, it took a deeper search for his body. When they pulled Landon out um, from the back of the car, he was not breathing. And they all started working on him right away to bring him back. Landon was resuscitated and life flighted to Carolina's medical center. He died two more times that day, and both times he was brought back to life. Doctors didn't give Julie much hope for his survival. They told me that if he lived, which did not look good, but that if he lived, that he would be like an eight-year-old baby, that um, he would not know how to walk or talk or to eat. 
I was so desperate that that was okay. I would take that just to have him. He was all that I had. At her husband's funeral, Julie remembers feeling abandoned by God. I was very disappointed, heartbroken. And while I'm sitting at the funeral, I'm fussing at God. I don't understand um, why this happened. I don't understand um, why He didn't send angels to protect us. But in the very next breath, I'm praying as hard to Him as I've ever prayed in my life for Landon to live. Landon had suffered massive head trauma during the accident and remained in a coma. He's hooked up to all kinds of machines to keep him alive. And there are no signs. There's nothing good or bad. They see nothing happening. I kept praying that he would open his eyes. After two weeks in a coma, Landon opened his eyes. To everyone's amazement, he had no brain damage. But in the midst of her joy, Julie knew she had to tell Landon about his father. He had scars on his face and his head was just full of hurt. And I didn't want to hurt him anymore. So I asked Landon, I said, Landon, do you know where your dad is at? And he told me, yes, I know where he's at. I saw him in heaven. Landon is now grown, but still clearly remembers his amazing experiences in heaven. I remember being able to see my dad and his friend, Olin Palmer, who had passed away less than a month before he did, also in a car accident, and Olin's son, Neil Palmer, who had died on a four-wheeler years before. Never one of us said a word to each other, but we were just all standing there. He looked over to me and says, oh, Mom, by the way, I forgot to tell you, I saw your other two kids. And I just looked at him because um, I, I wasn't sure what he was talking about, but um, I had two miscarriages before Landon was born. We had never shared that with Landon. He did not know that um, we had lost two children before him. I had knew that they were my siblings, even though no one had ever told me about them. Just being in heaven, I, I guess you know, you know your own or you know who everyone is. He says each time he died, he had a different experience in heaven. During the third time, he says he met Jesus and was given a mission. It was almost as if like um, a preview of a movie to where you only get to see certain bits and pieces of things. Jesus came to me and told me that I have to go back to earth and be a good Christian and tell others about him. Today, through Grief Share, Landon and Julie use their story to help others who are struggling with loss and in need of hope. I didn't understand in 1997, you know, why God didn't send an angel, but I know that there were angels there, and I know that um, we were protected, and we are living out what His plan is for us. Instead of staying mad at Him, I was able to use the story to help others not to give up and to um, keep their faith on their grief journey. I just want people to realize that Jesus is real. There is a heaven, there are angels, and um, to follow His Word in the Bible, and life does get better at the end. In her book, Faith Has Its Reasons, Julie says God has used their experience to bring others closer to Him and has brought new blessings to them. It is a huge blessing that I get to watch my child tell others about Jesus. He is always willing to let others know that there is a heaven because he's been there. I know I'm doing it for Jesus. I know that he's real. I know that angels are there. I know that there's a heaven. I'm not doing it for someone who I don't know or I've never seen. I've seen Jesus. I know he's there. He's asked me to do this, and this is what I'm doing. I've seen Jesus, and I've known He's there. It's one of the things that marked the disciples. It was marked that they had been with Jesus. And when, you're, when you've had that, when you've had that experience, then you no longer fear the future. You know where you're going. 
You know that you will be with him for all eternity and nothing can ever snatch you away. Now for Landon, you, you do get into why? Why did this happen? Why were they hit by an ambulance? Why did his father die? Why do these things happen? Well, the Bible's clear that time and chance happen to us all. The universe has built into it that accidents happen. Things that are unpredictable, things that you can't plan for, things that seem overwhelming, and you, and you are left with why? why. Why is this happening? Well, part of it is to show the glory of the Lord that he is able in the middle of your accident, in the middle of time and circumstance happening to you, in the middle of all of that, he's able to see you through it. And the Apostle Paul wrote, we know that all things work together for good. And here's a man who had been through shipwrecks, who had been beaten, who had been rejected. He had been left for dead. And he says, all things work together for good for them that love God and are called according to his purpose. He knew where he was going. He had that assurance and he knew at the end of his life, all of these things would work together for good. Now, do you know that? Do you have that assurance? Do you know that when you die, you'll be with Jesus in heaven? Do you know that? Do you have that certainty within you? Well, if you don't know that, the great news, and it's the best news that's ever been told, is that Jesus came for you. He died for you so that you could be with him for all eternity. He paid the price for every sin, for all people, for all time, and he settled it. And he announced on a cross, it is finished. His work was done. He had accomplished for all eternity what God had sent him to do. Now to receive this forgiveness, all you have to do is ask for it. And then you too can meet Jesus. Not in some far off time, not in the sweet by and by, but right here, right now. All Christians know him, know his presence. And he says, my sheep hear my voice. You can have these incredible supernatural experiences right where you are because he comes to you. If you want it, all you have to do is ask for it. So today, let today be the day where you ask for it. Don't turn away. Don't decide to do something else. But today can be a miracle day for you where you can have his presence in, in your life. Know with certainty where you'll be when you die. You can have it all if you just ask. So if this is for you, bow your head with me. Let's pray a very simple prayer and let Jesus do all the rest. Pray with me. Jesus, that's right, say his name, say it out loud. Jesus, I come to you and I ask that you reveal yourself to me. I open the door of my heart. I ask that you come into my life. And Jesus, I ask that you forgive me and give me the assurance that I will be with you for all eternity. Hear my prayer. Come into my life. Be with me now, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Father, for those who just prayed, I ask for a baptism in your love. I ask that your presence would surround them and fill them to overflowing. Let them know 
that their prayer has been heard and has been answered today. Do it, Lord, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you prayed with me, there's one more thing I want you to do. The Bible says that if you believe in your heart and then confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. So do that. Call somebody, 1-800-759-0700, and say, I prayed with that guy on TV. I asked Jesus to come into my heart. When you call, I've got a free packet for you. It's a CD teaching, what do you do now? And how do you live the Christian life? It's called A New Day. It's all free, phone calls free, packets free. All you have to do is make the call, 1-800-759-0700. Terry, over to you. Well, when we come back, we're going to bring it on with your email questions. It's all coming up. Well, here's our email question for today, Gordon. This is from a viewer who says, it's said that people go to hell for willful, willful sin and the unpardonable sin cannot bring someone back to repentance. So my question is, isn't all sin willful? Will we sin until our last breath? I want to love God more, but sin holds me back. What should I do? Do I need to stand on the promises of God and words of Jesus? Uh, definitely stand on the promises of God. Stand on the words of Jesus. These words are wonderful. They ring in your ears. There is no sin that cannot be forgiven. Let those words ring into you. Uh, now, if you've got a problem with willful sin, if you're continuing in that, you should get free from it. Uh, go to your pastor. Ask him to pray for you. Sometimes you need to be delivered from pat patterns of behavior. Uh, you need to have accountability. Uh, you need to say, I want to be free from this thing. I don't want this haunting me. Uh, you absolutely do not want to die in your sins. Uh, it used to be in the you know, third, fourth century, Christians would be baptized right before death if they could possibly wait until then, they would. But don't let that concern you. Let Jesus be your all in all and let his words ring throughout your life. We leave you these words from 1st 2nd Corinthians. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord.